This is not the time for political fun and games. This is the time for a new beginning. I ask you now to put aside any feelings of frustration or helplessness about our political institutions and join me in this dramatic but responsible plan. Join me. President Ronald Wilson Reagan addressing the country from the Oval Office in July of 1981. President Reagan had assumed office just six months earlier. The nation was mired in a bad recession, and Mr. Reagan used the power and the prestige of a primetime Oval Office address to present his way out, his vision of how the country could get back on its economic feet. In a few days, the Congress will stand at the fork of two roads. One road is all too familiar to us. It leads ultimately to higher taxes. The other road promises to renew the American spirit. It's a road of hope and opportunity. It places the direction of your life back in your hands where it belongs. Tax cuts, not just any tax cuts, the largest set of tax cuts this country had ever seen. With all sorts of charts and graphs at his disposal, President Reagan walked the country step by step through his tax plan. An across the board tax cut of 25% for all income brackets. Everybody gets a tax cut. After months of selling his plan, Congress finally passed it and President Reagan signed it into law. This represents $750 billion in tax cuts over the next five years. And this is only the beginning. And thus was born a new economic philosophy, Reaganomics, cutting government spending, cutting regulation, and cutting taxes, cutting taxes especially for the richest Americans. President Reagan's tax plan cut the top tax rate for the wealthiest Americans from 70% to 50%. Why cut taxes so dramatically for the richest of the rich in the middle of a recession? More trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics. The idea of trickle-down economics is basically this. You cut tax rates for the richest Americans, therefore the richest Americans have more. They have more money in their pockets. Therefore, they have more money to spend and invest. And as they spend and invest, the effect of rich people's good fortune and rich people's spending trickles down to everybody else in the economy. A rising tide lifts all boats, right? That was the idea. That was the plan. That did not happen. Reaganomics was a spectacular success in some ways. It was a spectacular success for the richest Americans in the country who benefited the most from President Reagan's historic debt-exploding, budget-busting tax cuts. In 1980, the top 1% of Americans earned wages of about $110,000 a year. By 1990, after about 10 years of Reaganomics, boing, the top 1% had seen their wages rise by 80%. Trickle-down economics, though, right? What's good for the rich is good for all of us, right? Not quite. Here's the average wages of the rest of the country in 1980, and here's what happened for the rest of the country after about 10 years of Reaganomics. Flat. A whopping 3% rise in wages in 10 years. The richest people see their fortunes go up like the Matterhorn. Everybody else, feh, nothing. This is what family income growth looked like during the 1980s. Look at that. The richest 1% of Americans had an awesome decade. They saw their family income skyrocket by 74%. Everybody else, not so much. In fact, the poorest Americans saw their income shrink by more than 4%. That was Reaganomics. That was what Reaganomics did. That was the impact of Reaganomics. That was the results of this experiment called trickle-down economics. The rich did great. Everybody else, still waiting for the trickle. Today, downtown Chicago is getting ready for the Christmas shopping season, but the merchants in one neighborhood, Inglewood, expect little Christmas business this year. Most of their customers are on public aid, which has been cut by the Reagan administration. At Judge Barber's furniture store, pre-Christmas sales have not attracted shoppers, and Barber blames Reaganomics. The customers that are coming in are certainly less than those that were coming in before the economics of Mr. Reagan's took place. But some people elsewhere will be spending more this Christmas. At luxury stores like Neiman Marcus in Northbrook, Illinois, a wealthy suburb of Chicago, store manager Larry Gore predicts record sales, especially in jewelry and furs. Gore says his customers have more to spend this year because of the Reagan tax cuts. At the end of 1989, after eight years of Reaganomics, here's where the country stood. Income gap between richest and poorest, biggest since 1947.
That was the headline on UPI on December 30th, 1989. That month, Congress released a report on Reaganomics that concluded, quote, upper income Americans were the main direct beneficiaries of tax cuts in the early 80s. There's no evidence in our data that those benefits have trickled down. Aside from not trickling, the era of Reaganomics also had one other awesome side effect. When President Reagan came into office in 1981, he inherited a $994 million national debt. By the time he left, it had ballooned to $2.6 billion. Ronald Reagan, patron saint of fiscal conservatism, supposedly, grew the national debt by an astonishing 186 percent during his eight years in office, which is what tends to happen when the government drastically reduces the amount of tax revenue it collects. When the Reagan folks tried to argue that the huge deficits they were creating were not that big of a deal, they were kindly corrected by editorials like this one in the Washington Post from January 1988. Quote, the deficit is a terrible legacy for which the country will be paying socially as well as financially for years. The only thing worse would be to believe the gloss now being put on it that would condemn another generation to repeat what the country should repent instead. So the largest income inequality since the government started tracking those things and a skyrocketing national debt. Thank you, Reaganomics. And this is only the beginning. On that point, Ronald Reagan was right. Trickle-down economics is back. It's making a comeback. What we've got to do is try, as we may, and, and see if we can deliver to make sure that tax rates don't go up on anybody. What we need is to get the entrepreneurs and investors back being willing to commit capital. Anybody that thinks that raising taxes on job creators is going to create jobs, I, I think is going to meet with an argument from me. You can't have a healthy economy if you raise taxes on those uh, that uh, you expect to reinvest in the economy and to hire more people. You can't have a healthy economy unless you give special bonus tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires. If millionaires and billionaires can't get an extra tax cut, nobody else should get a tax cut either. Everybody else's taxes can go up. Those are the people, those rich people, those are the ones who invest. Give them money and watch it trickle down to everybody else. Go ahead, watch it trickle down to everybody else. Just watch, see what happens. Watch the country right itself by giving massive tax cuts to the super rich. Average hourly wages have dropped four and a half percent that five million workers have lost their jobs because of factory closings and corporate cutbacks, and that the nation's richest families are getting a bigger slice of the economic pie, while the growing number of poor people are getting a smaller slice. Just watch. There is a key difference, of course, between now and 1981. Now, we have a president in the White House who doesn't subscribe to the economic theory that one of his Republican predecessors used to call voodoo economics. We've been told that the way to a stronger economy was to give huge tax breaks to corporations and the wealthiest Americans, and somehow prosperity would trickle down. Well, now we know the truth. It didn't work. Instead of prosperity trickling down, pain has trickled up. It didn't work. Giving billions of dollars in tax breaks to the super rich did not work. The difference between now and 1981 is not on the Republican side. They're still selling trickle down. The difference between now and then is the president now doesn't buy it. And the rest of us know what happened the last time somebody tried to promise us a trickle.